Amen. Well, after that uh, prophecy update, we all need to hear from God's Word. So we ask uh, that the Lord will um, inhabit our hearts in, in the praises of His people and um, the reading of His Word so that we can know what to do in times like this. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank You that through this passage today, Lord, uh, uh, Lord so much encouragement. This could be really called pure encouragement because it is by your spirit, that we'll be able to read, learn, and understand, and put it into action. For Father, I pray for the believers here today that they would walk from this place, Lord, full of your spirit, confident, and that, Lord, things will happen in their lives only by your spirit, and that they would uh, grab onto it, Lord. They would seek after with all their hearts that it's not by might or by power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and woke me up as a man who's awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand of all gold with this bowl on top of it and its seven lamps and one of the seven sp- uh, and on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and one on the other side on the left. And I answered and said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? And so the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Will you become a great plain? And he will bring forth the top stone, or the the capstone, with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and on his hand will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. And I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and of the lampstand and on the left? And I answered the second time and said to him, What are these two olive branches, which are besides the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me, saying, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. So it's a very powerful chapter. And of course, we're dealing with the book of Zechariah, which has an end goal in mind, the new Jerusalem. This is where we're headed. It's not just about Zechariah, but it's it's not just about the book of Zechariah, but it's also about the book of Revelation coming ahead. Zechariah spoke of his time, spoke of the first coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, and of course, the future time, the millennial kingdom. It's fascinating to me when you see the book of Zechariah, and we talked about it, all these incredible things come out of it when you read it. They are all in the book. Things about the last days, things about the Antichrist, things about Jesus' first coming, second coming. And as we look through the book of Zechariah, we're going to see some fascinating things, especially today, because this chapter is related to the one that we did last week when we were in the high desert. We did the chapter on chapter 3 on Joshua the high priest. So chapter 3 and chapter 4 go very much together. There's no chapter division, so this should be read one after the other. We only had time to do last week one of the characters. Today we're going to do the second character, Zerubbabel. So as we read Zechariah more closely, we remember that the two chapters have to do with leadership. Leadership. The Jewish people come back from exile. 
they are wondering, what does the Lord have for us? We were kicked out of the land because of our sin, idolatry, and immorality. We left the Lord. He allowed us to be overtaken by these nations. The Israel, the, the kingdom of Israel, the north, went to Assyria. But this is the southern kingdom. And they went to Babylon. But God made a promise. Seventy years later, he would bring them back into the land. And by an edict of Cyrus the Great, they came back to the land, 50,000 of them, 50,000 of them. And they were told by the Lord that they were needed to reconstruct the temple that had been destroyed. And they began to do the work. And we read in chapter 1 and chapter 2, especially in the book of Haggai as well, that the people started the work but didn't continue the work. They were overcome by their enemies, by their threats, and also by their laziness and apathy. They started caring about the things of themselves, their own comfort and leisure and their own life and their own livelihood, rather than building the house of the Lord. And we talked about that when we did the book of Haggai, which is related to this, that although we're not the application of those books, this one in Haggai, although we're not building a literal physical temple, there is a temple that we need to be concerned about the building, and the expansion of that temple. And that is in the New Testament, it's called the people of God, the church of Jesus, the believers. We are to be active and serving and building up the body of Christ and expanding the temple of the Lord because we are the temple of the Lord. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we're not building a building. We're building people. We're building people up. We're discipling them. We're helping them grow. And just like the children of Israel, just like the Jews in the book of Zechariah, they were more concerned with their own lives and their own comfort and leisure than building the house of God. And that is the case of the church today. Many, many Christians are more concerned with their own lives, with their own homes, with their own expansion of their own kingdom rather than building the kingdom of God. And Zechariah and Haggai called them out and it says, Repent, return to the Lord. What are you doing? You've forsaken the Lord and his work. And they had literally stopped building the temple. They literally had stopped building the temple. And God sends these men, Zechariah and Haggai, to wake them up out of their sleep. But in coming back to them, they have two leaders. And this is what leadership is about. They have two leaders, Joshua the high priest, which we read last week, and Zerubbabel which is the governor. The, um, they didn't have a king. Remember, the, the, the line of David had stopped at Jeconiah, and now they had what they called governors, like a civil ruler, and it was Zerubbabel. And these two leaders were to lead the people of God in the construction of the temple and the building up of God's, um, God's house, building up of God's house. That's what they were called to do. Later on, we read in Nehemiah that they were to construct or rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. This is about the temple right now. It's only about the temple. And we read last week that Joshua the high priest was in a vision. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. If you go to chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the Lord, the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at the right hand. The accuser of the brethren was standing next to Joshua the high priest, accusing him. And it's an interesting word because the word Satan is the word accuser, the word accuser. So the accuser was accusing, or you could say he was satanizing him, satanizing him, right? Satan, that's his name, that is his accusations, the play on words. Satan means accuser and he was accusing. He's satanizing him. That's what he does. And he was accusing him. And of course, this is about leadership. Joshua's not a good leader. Get rid of him. He doesn't deserve to be a leader in your home or in your people. He accuses him. And it says that the Lord rebuked them. The Lord rebuked them because he had chosen Jerusalem and he rebuked them twice. He chose Jerusalem. It was God's choice to be the Jews to be God's people. It was his choice. Joshua is representing the people, 
right? That's what a high priest does. He represents the people before God and God before the people. So God chose Jerusalem, and he says Jerusalem, or the people of God, are like a brand plucked out of the fire, like a branch plucked out of the fire. Literally, they were just about to be extinguished and destroyed, and God pulled them out. And that's how he rebukes Satan. It's just not a brand plucked from the fire. Well, all Christians are a branch plucked out of the fire. All Christians are a branch plucked out of the fire. All of us had that smoky aftertaste of the Lord rescuing us, maybe some more than others. But if it wasn't for God's grace, none of us would be here. None of us is here because we're so good, we're so smart, and we did it ourselves, and we're so spiritual. We sought the Lord on our own. All of us were a brand plucked out of the fire. And Israel's the same. And God made that choice to save us, right? He made that choice to save us, and he plucked us out. And look what it says in verse 3. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, literally garments of vomit and excrement. And he was standing before the angel of the Lord. In God's, in Satan's accusation, and in the people's eyes, Joshua was filthy, Right? He was not only representing the people of God, but also his own sin. But then the Lord says in verse 4, Remove the filthy garments and clothe them with new garments. Isaiah 61. He has clothed me with righteousness. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. That's what the Lord does. He has lifted me up and clothed me with the righteousness of Jesus, according to the New Testament. Take off those garments Put new garments on. That's a picture of salvation. Putting off, putting on. But then Paul says in the, in the book of Colossians and Ephesians that we are to continue putting off the old man and keep, keep putting on Christ. It's not just something God does, but it's something we are to continue to do daily, consistently, Amen. right? Amen. Consistently, daily, constantly, as we put off the old nature and put on Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh because that's what it means to walk in the Spirit, drawing close to Jesus. And we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit today. So when the Lord rebukes Satan and he tells them, this is what I've done, I've chosen them. I have chosen Israel. I've chosen Jerusalem. By the way, if people like it or not, God has chosen the Jewish people and Jerusalem. There's lots of talks today among churches about replacement theology. No, we have not replaced anybody. Gentile believers are expanded into the kingdom. We are, by expansion, now part of the olive tree. But we don't replace the natural ones, the natural branches. We are expanded into God's kingdom. We were once far off, Paul said. Now we have been brought near through the blood of Messiah. And it's a wonder, wonderful thing. And at the end of that chapter, this is just last week, we see that there's a promise. The promise is that, Joshua, you are a symbol. You are a symbol of what's to come. And I'm going to bring my servant, the branch. My servant, the branch. And he will be like a stone. And he'll have seven eyes. And the inscription on the stone will say, I will remove the iniquity in that land in one day. Imagine the, the, the Davidic line, the line of the king, as a stump that has been taken down. You walk into a forest and you see a stump and nothing's growing out of it. It's dead. But then you'll come back two weeks later and there's a little sprout coming out of the stump. That's the branch. That's the sprout. It's the root of David, according to Isaiah. Just when you thought the Davidic line was dead, Israel's done and over with, the prophets lamented, how is God going to bring us back? There's the branch, my servant, the branch. And that's what the Lord says to uh, Joshua. You are a picture, a symbol, a type that I'm going to bring my servant because in one day he is going to remove the iniquity. Not only did he die on the cross for the penalty of sin, but one day he's going to return soon to that same place, Jerusalem, and he is going to open a fountain 
for cleansing, for iniquity, to cleanse them from their sin and to remove their sin as God pours out his spirit on the Jewish people, they'll have what we've had, a born-again experience. And the Lord will remove their sin and they will look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn for him. There'll be a repentance, a national repentance, and the Lord will remove their idolatry and their sin and the false teachers from that land. So now, chapter 4, continuation. Wake up, Zechariah, something really important. This, when you see somebody being awoken like this, somebody waking out of a sleep in this situation, it has something to do with the last days. Remember, the, 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 the five foolish virgins and the five wise ones, they were all asleep, but the wise ones woke up and they had oil and they went to meet the bridegroom. Paul says in the book of Romans, awake, you sleeper. And Christ will raise you up from the dead. There'll be a resurrection, but we need to wake up. It is high noon. Salvation is nearer than when we first believed, Paul says. Now you say, Pastor, how can salvation be near if we already have it? Simply because salvation is something you have, but something you go after as well. It's that balance of Scripture. Right? We have salvation. If you have it, go after it with even more fervency because it's coming. Salvation is near than when we first believed. Paul is, of course, talking about the end times, talking about wake up out of our sleep so that Christ can rule in our lives. He's woken up and he's shown a great vision. This is the fifth vision. Remember, there's a total of eight that we're going to see in the book of Zechariah. This is number five. And it's a picture, it's quite an interesting thing, of a lampstand, a lampstand. And this lampstand's quite unique. It's made out of pure gold, it says, out of all gold. And, of course, in the Old Testament, you see these lampstands, what they call the menorah. And these menorahs were in, was part of the tabernacle, part of the furniture of the tabernacle in the wilderness. When, the, when they went into the temple, when, they, when Solomon made the temple, uh, it wasn't just one, it was ten, five on each side of the temple. Just have to read, I think it's 1 Kings chapter 7. Two sides, five menorahs, five menorahs, ten of them. So you had a lampstand, basically 70, seven, seven zero lights shining in this place. In the wilderness, they had one going into the holy place. In the temple, they had, they had ten, and each one has seven branches. So it's a total of 70 shining, a light. Of course, the light represented God's salvation, God's light to the world, God's knowledge of the, uh, to the world. Uh, but it also represented the people of God, that they were to take the light of God and to shine it to the world, to be a light to the Gentiles, the Lord says about Israel. You're going to be a light to the Gentiles so they can come and know me. Of course, that is a picture of the Messiah as well. In a prophecy of Isaiah, we're told that the Messiah would be a light to a people that sat in darkness. A great light has come. The Messiah had come and be a light. But it was going to be the Jewish people taking the light to the world. Now, they didn't do it. They failed at it. And so now, because they failed, God has found other people, Jew and Gentile together, to go and take the light to the world. The Lord says in the, in the Gospels, you are the light of the world. Of course, Jesus is the light of the world, but through him we have the light to take out to the world. It is Christians who are the light of the world to bring the message and the knowledge of God to the world so they can know him, the knowledge of God. And so this menorah, fascinating, three on one side, three on the other, one in the middle, seven branches, seven branches in each menorah. And Zechariah sees this seven-branch menorah, and there's more, though. It says it's made out of pure, pure gold, and there's a bowl on top of it. And on its seven branches, uh, and on its seven branches, on which are on top of it. Also, two olive trees, one on the right side of the bowl and the other one on the left side of the bowl. Now, this is, it gets really kind of confusing, but we'll kind of keep it as simple as we can. There's many, many different drawings you can find on the internet. There's, there is sort of a uh, division among 
scholars, what, does, what did it look like? We know for sure there's two olive trees, one on the left, one on the right. There's a bowl on top of this lampstand. And it's connected to the seven branches. It's connected to the seven branches. Each of the branches, what I call the branches, is the candlestick. So when I say candlestick, it's the, the actual branch. So it's a menorah, a bowl on top of it. And each one of the branches, there's seven, has a little spout at the top where the wick comes out. Right? When I was a kid, we used to make these little lamps. I don't know if you guys made it, but uh, I used to make little lamps of like tin, tin cans, and you put a wick on it, and you fill it up with kerosene, and there you have it, your own little lamp, lamp stand. Uh, this is quite a bit different, but each one of those branches has a, like a bowl on top of it, and the wick goes in there. That's where the oil is. Now, the, the, the priest had to fill it up every day in the temple because they would burn for 24 hours. So every 24 hours, you had, the, 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 the priest had to go and fill up the lamp Fill up those spouts with oil, make sure the wick is trimmed and clean, and they can burn again, right? Every day in the temple. This was part of the priestly duties in the holy place. The table of showbread, the candlestick, all these things had to be done on a daily, on a daily basis. This is a quite unique experience for Zechariah because it says these seven spouts... These branches, the seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Now, this is where it becomes controversial in a sense of how did it look like? Some scholars believe it was, it was just like that. Seven branches attached to the bowl and there was oil in it. Other, other scholars believe that according to the description, each one of the spouts had seven, had, uh, each one of the lamps had seven spouts on each branch. Each branch had seven spouts on top of it. And so what you had was seven times seven. Seven branch, seven branches, and seven spouts on each one. Seven times, seven times seven would have been 49. So some scholars believe this was a, a radiant, incredible lamp with 49 shining fires coming across. Some believe it was just seven, that he's just referring to the seven branches. Some believe it was seven branches plus seven spouts on each branch. Either way, you have a magnificent spout, a magnificent branch, a magnificent candlestick, because it's something unique about it. What's missing from this, what should you say, what's the difference between this and this? Think of the supply of oil. Who provided the oil here? Here? We don't know yet, right? It hasn't been described to us. We kind of get the idea. There's no priest. There is no priest helping this. That would have been the, hey, what happened to the priest, right? Because we're not Jews. We didn't, we didn't think of anything of it, right? But if you were a Jew, you would have gone, hey, isn't that the job of, uh, you know, cousin so-and-so? That's, that's what he does, right? <laughs> He's a Levi. Well, here's the difference. There are no priests in this. Why there are no priests? God's doing it. God's doing it. Amen. Now think about this. You've got to remember, they came from the exile. They had no priest. Joshua was the high priest. They didn't have a temple yet. It hasn't even been built yet. Their probably concern was, well, how are we ever going to worship God? How are we ever going to get close to God? We have no priesthood. We have a high priest, but doesn't the high priest need a temple in order to bring the sacrifice? Where's the temple? Well, they hadn't built it yet. How are we going to get it done? It's been quite a while since we got it done. We stopped working. Haggai is telling us we're not doing the job. Zechariah is being stirred by the Lord to remind us that we're not doing the work. And Zechariah is given this vision. Remember, he is bringing the message to the people as a prophet. So you have this perfect picture now. We have the prophet Zechariah, we have Joshua the high priest, and then we're introduced to this character later on in, this, in verse 6. It's called Zerubbabel, which is the kingly line. He's a descendant of David. Now, it's interesting that there are two olive trees, and the olive trees are going to become really, really important, especially at the end. What are these olive trees? Look at verse 3. 
the two olive trees by it, one on the right, one on the left of the bowl, and on the other side. Then I answered and said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel was speaking to me, said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, I don't know, my Lord. It's like the question is not being answered. He keeps asking. Verse 6, He answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but my, by, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He gets no answer to what are these olive trees, but he does get an answer that he wasn't asking. He has an answer that, to a question he wasn't asking. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Remember, Zerubbabel is a descendant of David. You read the genealogy of Matthew, genealogy of Luke. In the center of that genealogy, there's a man named Zerubbabel. He is in the line of Jesus. He is a descendant of David. They have no king because the last king uh, was exiled and he was killed. And so now Zerubbabel is acting on behalf of the kingly line. The high priest has been restored in chapter 3 with new garments of salvation. He's been justified by God. Now this Zerubbabel, once that's been done, now needs to know that he's going to have to do the work. But he's not going to have to do the work alone. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. The first word is might. It's, in Hebrew, it's the word for military. Military. Not by military power. The other word is strength or power, and it's the word for a man's strength. A single man's strength. So each one of those two words have a, a different meaning. Not by might, military. Not by power, human strength, like a personal strength. It was used to carry, like when somebody carried water, you did it with your strength. You did it with your you know, own volition and power. It's not going to be through that. It's not going to be by the load you carry. It's going to be by the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. In other words, the breath of God, because yeah, that's what the word Ruach means, the breath of God. It's translated breath, it's translated spirit. It's the same spirit in the, in the book of Genesis, the creation of the worlds. In Exodus 15, we're told that by the breath of God, the Red Sea parted. And we're told in Ezekiel 37, it's the same breath that comes and gives life to the dry bones in the desert. It is the Spirit of God. And it says that it's, that it's connected, the idea is connected to what um, Zerubbabel, or I'm sorry, Zechariah just saw, the vision of the lamp. So you have oil and you have spirit, which goes hand in hand together in the scriptures. Certain oils, I mean, certain liquids represent the Holy Spirit. And here's one that is very, very uh, straightforward. It's oil. Shemen, in Hebrew, shemen. And the idea of shemen is take the oil and anoint the head of people, right? Yeah. We call that to anoint Mashiach, right? The idea of Messiah is to anoint the head. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Mashiach because he's been anointed with shemen, oil, right? So the oil is the representation of the Holy Spirit. So it's starting to make sense what this vision is. He just saw a candlestick connected to a bowl of oil, right? Connected to it. There's oil, and it is connected to the Holy Spirit. The two olive trees uh, are representing, of course, of somebody carrying the oil, right? Because oil is found in, in olive trees. And here we have... The real strength from, for God's people, the real strength of God's people comes from the Lord. The real strength of God's people comes from the Lord. Now, what was the, what was the power of the Spirit needed in this situation? What was Zerubbabel trying to do? So let's not over-spiritualize this. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Exactly. Now, you may seem like, oh, that's kind of disappointing. I thought it would be some great spiritual thing. Well, it is a great spiritual thing. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, it's a great spiritual thing. Whatever it is, you're like, well, I was just building, building a temple. What is that? 
I'd rather go and do something spiritual. Well, the idea is this is something very, very important that they were doing. And the rebuilding of the temple needed to be done by God's spirit. Um, so the, the giving of the spirit is for spiritual things, you would say, and for physical things as well. Whatever the Lord has us to do. Only, only if it's by his spirit, and only if the spirit is governing every detail, then that service can be glorifying to God. All right? Only if the Holy Spirit is governing the details of what you do can that service be glorifying to God. Amen. It's very important to remember. Only if it's the Holy Spirit. How do you know if it's the Holy Spirit? Well, for one thing, you know, it's, he's the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, right? The Numa Hegios in, in Greek. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to become more holy. Always lead you to become more holy more separated unto God. Another way you know is he's the spirit of truth. He's not the spirit of error. He's the spirit of truth. He's not the spirit of error. When the Holy Spirit is leading you something to do, it's truth. It's going to be right. It's going to be in the truth of God. The outcome may be a little bit unexpected of what you think is going to happen, but it's always going to be based on truth and based on holiness. And of course, in the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit working in power, the fire of the Holy Spirit, right? The, the wind coming, wind and fire, power to live a Christian life, the power to live a Christian life. That's, you know it's the Holy Spirit working in you. And only if he's governing the details of that work, then it can be glorifying to God. We sometimes, sometimes many times, substitute, substitute the work of the Spirit for our own strength and power. We rely on experience, we rely on resources rather than what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. And it's very important for Christians because this is Zerubbabel building the temple. Now, does it, um, some people say, well, if it's the Holy Spirit, then there's really no effort into it, right? We just wait and the Holy Spirit will do it. Did they have to work? Yes. All right? So let's not become over-spiritualizing. So I'm just going to sit here and just allow the Holy Spirit to just fill me up and, and, and that's it. That's the work that I have to do. It does require effort. I know that's a terrible word among Christians, right? We have to do something about it? Yes. But it's not by might nor by power. But pastor, aren't you contradicting yourself? No. Zerubbabel had to work. Paul said, I labor and strive for these things. Did Paul not have the spirit? So how do you, how do you balance that out, that it's effort in the spirit? How do you know when it's like, now I'm just striving in the flesh? The question, or the answer is more than anything, is when you are laboring, who are you trusting to finish the work? It has to be the Lord. Who are you trusting to complete the work? Because sometimes we could become like, well, I, I got to do it. And then you become concerned and worry, and you become you know, sort of neurotic at times. How are we going to do it? How are we going to finish it? That's when you know you're laboring in the flesh or in the spirit. If you're working and effort and striving in the Lord, then you know he's going to complete it. He who's faithful to complete it, right? He's faithful to complete it until that day. The Spirit of God is who we're trusting. Not trusting in ourselves. We're to do the work. God's people are to do the work. Remember, the leaders were to lead. That's a very important for the Jews. They had no leader except for Joshua and Zerubbabel. God chooses them. And by the looks of it, he anoints them. He cleanses them and he anoints them. But then the people have to give themselves over to the work. That's, by the way, ministry in a nutshell, too. God raises up leaders in a fellowship. And then the people give themselves over to the work as God leads and provides the Holy Spirit for the people to follow and serve, uh, serve him in that capacity. Zerubbabel had to put the effort in. It wasn't big. It wasn't even getting off the ground yet. It was small. And people were, later on we'll find out, people were despising it. They didn't even want him to do it. Now, let's look at verse 7. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a great plain, or a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone, or the capstone, with the shouts of grace and grace to it. This great mountain will be a plain, the Lord said. This great mountain will be a plain, and he'll bring the capstone and you'll shout grace to it. 
Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The land, the, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. This great mountain. Mountain, in this case, has to do with opposition. Go to Ezra. The book of Ezra chapter 4. Let's go there very quickly. The book of Ezra chapter 4. And the book of Ezra shows us something very unique. Something different than Zechariah. It's happening at the same time, but the book of Ezra is dealing with the things that Zerubbabel is dealing with on a day-to-day basis. The earthly things. Zechariah has given us some incredible visions. Incredible visions of heaven. See Joshua and the high priest, the high priest and, and Satan accusing him, kind of like the book of Job. And then he sees this lampstand. And look at chapter 4 of Ezra, Ezra chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple of the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's households. And they said to them, let us build with you, for we like you seek your God and we have been sacrificing to him since the day of Eshardon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and, Jesh- and Yeshua, the high priest, and the rest of the heads of the fathers, the household of Israel, said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build the Lord God of Israel will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. The enemies of Israel, who were they? Mainly the Samaritans. The Samaritans and the people of the land that were there when they came back from exile. These were people that were discouraging the work of God and they were threatening them. And they even wrote a letter to the king of Syria, or I'm sorry, the king of Persia, saying that Zerubbabel, who was a governor, prestige, was getting involved in the work. And he should be fired because he was such a high status that he had nothing to do with the menial work that they had to do in the temple, and they were trying to get him fired. But Zerubbabel gave himself to the work, and the Lord rewarded him and blessed him tremendously. So that's what they were dealing with. That's the threat. That's the enemies of God. Go back to Zechariah. That's the mountain that they were dealing with. What was the mountain? The threats of their enemies. The opposition. Didn't Jesus said, if you have enough faith, you can tell this mountain to move and it'll move. He was talking about the faith of the people. Remember, Herod was a man who moved mountains. You see that all through archaeology. You take a mountain and shove it in another mountain. And he did tremendous work in the Middle East. Herod the Great. He was a man that could move mountains. He was known for that. And Jesus was saying, my people are not going to do it by might or by strength or by slaves or by many powers that Herod had. They're going to do it by my spirit. If you have faith, you can tell this mountain move and it'll move. The people of the kingdom of God were to do it by faith, trusting in him to overcome these obstacles. Zerubbabel, you got a great obstacle. You got people that hate you, the people that come against you, and you got a great work ahead. And even your own people, they don't even want to help. You ever been there? No? You have probably been a Christian for a long time then. Maybe you haven't, right? You got the enemies coming at you. They don't want you to build the house of God. They don't want you to get involved in ministry. They don't want you to serve the Lord. You got this work ahead that the Lord's saying, go ahead and do it. And you're going like, how can I do this? I need help. And you turn to your brothers and sisters, and they don't want to help because they're more involved in their own home than building the house of God. And you're like, well, who's going to (laughs) help? And you feel defeated, and you see this great mountain. You see the little temple that's not even built yet. And you go, how are we going to do this? This is crazy. How did I get involved in this? I should just go back. (laughs) I should, I should not be involved in this. Who am I? What am I doing here? What did I bring my family out to do? Right? Well, that was me. Sorry. Uh, Zerubbabel probably felt like that, just discouraged. 
Nobody's felt like that before here, huh? No? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Daily. No. Um, we tend to get like that, right? But it was the enemies of God. Well, who was accusing Joshua, Yeshua the high priest? It was Satan. You're not a good leader. Look at your sin. You're filthy. You have excrement on you. You vomit on you. You live with people that are just as sinful. You can't lead. Right? You felt like that? The enemy accusing you? Yeah. That's whether you believe the Lord or believe Satan. Jesus said... Take off those filthy garments, put a new one on them. Amen. All right? Put the head to toe covered with the garments of salvation of Jesus. Zerubbabel's going through the same thing now. But see, chapter 3, the, the cleansing of the Lord, he puts on new garments. Every leader needs to start there. We first realize that we're not better than the people that we're ministering to. We're just as sinful as the people that we're trying to minister to. The only difference, Jesus has put on new robes for us. Amen. He died for us and clothed us with the garments of salvation. Now we can lead because it's now we have humility in our hearts. We're, a, we're a, a branch plucked out of the fire. We don't deserve this. We're filthy, yet Christ cleanses us. Now you can lead. But Lord, how am I going to do the work? You're going to need something that's not from you. Not by might, nor by power. This great mountain, don't worry about it. It's going to be a plane. It's going to be an easy plane. It's going to be removed. How is it going to be removed? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Four years later, four years later, they rebuilt the temple. Amazing. Four years, four years from this moment, they rebuilt the temple. How did they do it? Without... Equipment, with that machinery, with that technology, they did it. Why? Because there was a, a bowl of oil above the lampstand, and it was feeding the lampstand with oil so it could burn bright. Remember, the lampstand is the people of God. They needed the oil in order to do the work. The lampstand could not shine unless the oil was in there, but the people could not produce the oil. It had to come from somewhere, had to come from above, had to come from the oil. And it was impossible. But they say, it says, shouts of grace. Grace, doing what you cannot do on your own. The word of the Lord came. The hands of Zerubbabel, verse 9, have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. In verse 7, he had to put the capstone. The capstone is the one that goes above the building, the final stone. It's interesting, I've read about buildings. In the ancient times, most people that started the work never finished it. They died before the, the, the building was constructed because it took years. It took years and years and years to put it. So the original guy who laid the foundation never put the capstone on because they were dead by then. But here God says, not only is Zerubbabel going to lay the foundation, he's going to put the capstone on it. He's going to start it and he's going to finish it. It's amazing. That's it's, it's unheard of. But he's working through God's spirit. And it says, he, verse 10, who has despised the day of small things? Who has despised the day of small things? Day of small beginnings. These seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. The plumb line is a tool. It's a tool that you use to make things straight, keep things straight. It has a little, usually a little stone, a string on it, and you can measure things, and the stones had to be straight because of the plumb line. And the plumb line in the Bible becomes a picture of the Word of God, a picture of the Word of God, a standard of God. The standard of God is always straight. It's always straight. How do you know something's crooked unless you have something that's straight? How do you know if your life is right you compare it to what God's word says, right? We are to rightly divide, straight, straight, cut it straight, the word of God, the word of truth. We're to live by it. And these seven, and these seven have to do with chapter three. Look at verse nine of chapter three. Go back one chapter. Behold, the stone that I have said before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription. It says, the Lord of hosts, I will remove the iniquity of the 
land in one day. In chapter 4, verse 10, these are, these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. The eyes of the Lord, perfect knowledge and all discernment. He sees all. He understands what's going on, just like the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. The Lord walks in the midst of the churches. He has seven eyes, seven spirits of God. He knows what's going on. Verse 11. Then I answered and said, what are these two olive trees? One on the right and one on the left. What are they? He keeps asking the question. And I answered a second time. What are these two olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered and said, do you not know? And he says, I don't. Verse 14. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones, literally the sons of the oil, who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. A lamp has oil, right? The, this lamp has oil, and the oil comes from this bowl on top. And it says that they are, these two are the anointed ones, the tree are the anointed ones who are standing by the Lord. In verse 12, it says that they were, um, in verse 11, sorry, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left? which stand by the golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves, we have, a, we have a new information here. The olive trees have a pipe that connects to the bowl that sits on top of the menorah or the lampstand. These olive trees are receiving the oil from the bowl as well. So it's not only the bowl that is coming into uh, bringing the oil into the lampstand, but it's also feeding the olive trees, feeding the olive trees. So who are these two olive trees that are getting the oil from the same bowl that the lamp is getting the oil from? It says these two are the anointed ones. Who have we been talking about? Joshua and Zerubbabel. These are the two sons of oil that are standing before the Lord. Turn to Revelation chapter 11, please. Revelation chapter 11. And this is a question that we often get, and it's kind of a fun question, because we are told in chapter 11 that there are two witnesses coming at the end of the age. Revelation chapter 11. And there's given a measuring rod to measure out the temple of God in verse 1. And this they're told, measure out the temple and the altar and those who worship in it. But don't measure out the court outside, the outside court of the temple. Don't measure it, for it has been given over to the Gentiles, the nations, and they will tread underfoot, for, uh, underfoot the holy city for 42 months. We won't have time to get into the full aspect of Revelation 11, but this has to do with the Antichrist. There is a, a temple that is being, it's going to be rebuilt of some sort, a tribulational temple, we would call it. And this temple, this, this particular temple is where the Antichrist will come in, according to Daniel chapter 9 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's going to be a temple where the Antichrist is going to desecrate. Here in chapter 11 of Revelation, we're told that don't measure it out. The courtyard has been given over to the Gentiles for 42 months to trample underfoot for that period of time, 42 months, according to the lunar calendar, three and a half years. And I will grant authority to, to my two witnesses. God's going to bring two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Look what verse 4 says. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the whole earth, exactly out of Zechariah chapter 4. Who are the two witnesses? In Zechariah chapter 4, it's Zerubbabel and Joshua. Who are the ones here? We don't know. But there are other pictures in the Old Testament of two witnesses coming in and doing something. We have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, two angels coming in and taking Lot and his family. We have the two spies that go into Rahab's home 
and warn her before Joshua and, the, and Jericho. And then you have these two figures. Revelation 11. Two witnesses. What are they going to do? It says they're going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy for 1260 days. They're going to have the authority. In verse 5, if anyone desires to harm them, fire will come out of their mouth to devour their enemies. Kind of like uh, Elijah. And if anyone would desire to harm them, in this manner they will be killed and they will shut up the sky, just like just like Elijah, in order to reign may not fall during the days of, of their prophesying. So they're going to prophesy. They're going to prophesy because they're sent by the Lord to preach God's message. They're going to share God's message. What's God's message? That whatever's going on in this temple, it's not of God. Remember Joshua and Zerubbabel. Go back to Ezra 4. The people came to them. The enemies came. The Samaritans were a mix between the remnant of the Jewish people of Israel and of Assyrian. They were a mixed people called the Samaritans. There were also other people like the Horonites, but the, mainly the Samaritans. The Samaritans had turned the Jewish faith and they mixed it with pagan idolatry from the Assyrians and they created their own religion. They took the five books of Moses and they adopted it and they made lots of changes to it, some changes to it. And even the fact that the, they were to worship God in Mount Zion, they said it was supposed to be at Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim. And now you have the story. Now you have the story of John chapter 4, Jesus dealing with the Samaritan woman. She said, our fathers told that we're to worship in this mountain, but you say we're to worship in that mountain. And Jesus says, I guess in, 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 in context and in the vernacular, lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation is of the Jews. It's coming a time, and it now is, where the true worshipers of God are not going to worship in this mountain or that mountain. It's not going to be geography that's going to determine the place. It's going to be worship in spirit and in truth. When they came to Zerubbabel and Joshua, Zerubbabel and Joshua said, no, you can't build with us. You can't build with us. You Samaritans, you have desecrated the word of God. You have changed the word of God. You want to build with us the temple of God? No, we have nothing to do with you. In the same like manner, the two witnesses of Revelation are going to go to the Jewish people, to the people, to the whole world that's going to see them, and they're going to say, this mixture of pagan religion, Islam, ecumenism, Mixing it in with the true worship of God. It's not of God. This temple is a desecration. This temple is not of God. Ecumenism is out the door, and people are going to hate them. They're going to hate them so much that the beast and the false prophet, the two beasts, are going to challenge them. They're going to attack them, and they're going to attack them and persecute them, and eventually they'll be defeated because God, the time of their prophesying will be done. They will be killed. But three days later, they will rise again and be ascended up to heaven. And the whole world is going to see these two witnesses. Yet, the book of Zechariah says this started way back with Joshua and Zerubbabel. So let's go back to Ezekiel and let's finish off this passage. These are the two anointed ones standing by the Lord. The two witnesses are going to get rid of false unity. These two witnesses... Joshua and Zerubbabel, they did away with false unity. The Samaritans couldn't be part of the worship of God. We need leaders like this. Amen. We need leaders like this. We need leaders that are like the olive trees, who have the oil, the Spirit of God in them. They do it in the power of the Spirit. They know that they have been uh, justified by the Lord, cleansed by the Lord, but now they also need to have the anointing of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. If anyone's going to lead God's people, you need these two things. You need the cleansing from God and the anointing of the Spirit. That is what's needed in leaders. You say, Pastor, I'm not a leader. 
Well, maybe not yet, but in one sense, all of us are called to lead. Amen. Yes. Aren't we called to lead people to Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. In your home, in your work, in your community, in your family, you're called to lead. Amen. You need two things. Two main things. The cleansing from God. Knowing that you're no better than them. That you're a brand plucked by the, out of the fire and he cleansed you. And you don't deserve it. And you're just as filthy as they are. But the Lord clothed you with this righteousness. You need the cleansing. But you also now need to do the work. And that work requires the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. No doubt, no, no substitution. No substitution for the Holy Spirit. No amount of wisdom, no amount of experience, no amount of resources, no amount of intelligence. Not by might, even if you had a military background. <laughs> no by strength, your own strength, but by your spirit. He has made us kings and priests. Jesus says, the book of Revelation says he has made us kings and priests. He is the high priest, he's the king of kings, but we are priests and kings under him. The anointing is only through him. How are they anointed? Look at verse 14 again. They're anointed because they're standing by the Lord. That's the whole reason they're anointed. The word anointed, I mean the word uh, um, to stand by the Lord, it has to do with to be under the, or close proximity has to do with standing by or waiting on. That's another translation. Waiting on the Lord. Those who stand by waiting on the Lord are going to be the ones that will have the Spirit. You can't get the anointing just by us, uh, by just us Moses. <laughs> you know, I'm a Christian. I could just be around. You need to be close to the Lord. No substitution for that. People say, well, I come to church. Doesn't mean you've come to Christ. Coming to church is a poor, poor substitution for coming to Christ. Amen. Right? Coming to church is a poor substitution of coming. Doesn't mean you don't come, but you come to Christ first. Amen. You draw near to him first. You wait upon him and you fill yourself with the spirit of God. Then coming to fellowship is a great thing because you're cleansed, you're anointed, you have the power of the Spirit. The anointing only comes from being with Jesus. You don't get it by going to an experience or going to a, a, some church or having somebody lay their hands on you. That's not how you get it. That's not what this passage says. Well, this pastor said, doesn't matter what that pastor said. That is what the Word of God says. The anointing comes from being near to Jesus. He gives the Spirit. Now, when we finish, I just want to point something out really quick. Simply Jesus. These two characters are amazing. It will be really good to spend more time in reading it, but for the sake of time, we have to finish. Joshua and Zerubbabel are perfect pictures of Jesus. Yeshua, in chapter 3, filthy garments. He's the high priest. The book of Hebrews says Jesus is the high priest. What is the high priest doing to filthy garments? He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeshua is picturing Jesus bearing our sin. It wasn't his sin. It was my sin. It was your sin. He bore it. He became sin for us. He's standing there, and he's with filthy garments. But the Lord rebukes him twice. You see that? He rebukes him twice. He rebukes Satan twice. The cross and his second coming are the rebuking of Satan. One, he was defeated, and the second time he will be destroyed. The cross defeats Satan. The second coming of Jesus destroys him. We see the lampstands in chapter 4. In the book of Revelation, we're told Jesus walks among the lampstands. Walks. And what are the lampstands? The churches. The seven churches of Revelation are the lampstands. Who walks among them? Jesus. He knows everything about each church. 
He gives us the description of his church. You just read chapter 2 and chapter 3. Some were good, some were not so good. But he gives a description. He's the only one that has the Spirit. In a sense, he's the only one anointed. We're only anointed because he was anointed. You can't get anointed apart from Jesus. He's the true anointed one. And it says here that two, two olive trees are the anointed ones who stand before the Lord. And it says Zerubbabel is to build the house of the Lord, to establish the kingdom of God. On his first coming, Yeshua the high priest justifies sinners. On his first coming, Jesus justifies sinners, just like me, just like you. And his second coming, he establishes the kingdom. And that's why Zerubbabel in chapter 4 is all about establishing the house of the Lord, establishing the temple. Well, we don't have a physical temple. Jesus is not building a physical temple right now. He's building a spiritual house. You and me are the stones. He's building them up. He's building us up, and he is putting the Spirit in us. And so we see this, Daniel chapter 2, the kingdoms of this world are destroyed by the stone that comes from heaven, Jesus. There are mountains that are against Jesus. Did you know that? There are mountains that are against Jesus. What are these mountains? We won't have time tonight, but Revelation 17. The woman who rides the beast, she sits on a beast with seven heads. Revelation 17 says those seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sits on. There are seven, in a sense, headships that are for the Antichrist, but are against Christ. Seven mountains. It's interesting that dominionists have this idea of the seven mountain that we have to take over society, culture, education, things like that, the seven mountains. I don't know which Bible they read, but the seven mountains in the book of Revelation are seven kingdoms or seven powers that are given over to the Antichrist. Are the dominionists saying that they're part of the Antichrist kingdom? Maybe they, maybe that's what they're saying. But it says that there are seven mountains. What are the mountains before Zerubbabel? They'll become a great plain. What are these mountains in comparison to Jesus? Nothing. They'll become a great plain. And will be a shout from heaven. And we will be shouting too. The kingdom of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. This world will be ruled and reign by Jesus Christ. And what are we going to shout? Grace, grace, grace to it. Because nothing will ever overcome Christ. And the kingdom of Christ will go on forever and ever. And his people will be kings and priests under the most holy one. Why? Because he died and rose again. Because he's coming back. And in the meantime, he anoints his people for the work ahead. Because he wants as many men, women, and children to come and enjoy the kingdom of God. But there's a work ahead, isn't it? And you might feel like Zerubbabel today and go, this is a great mountain. <laughs> not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. But I'm so filthy. I messed up today. I fell. I lost my temper. I've had thoughts that I don't want to have. I've been drawn close to the Lord as I ought to be. Let him cleanse you. Put on Christ. Take out those filthy garments. Don't put him back on again. I never met anybody that wanted to wear vomit and excrement. But that's what we do when we entangle ourselves with sin. We're putting it back on. But Jesus said, take it off and put me on. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has given me the robes of righteousness. When you're clean, you came out of the shower or something like that, and you just, you smell good. Do you feel like jumping into like a trough of pigs and vomit and excrement? You, nobody in their right mind thinks like that. But man, we are so good about justifying our sin and coming back to the pigsty. As Peter says, the dog returns to his own vomit. It is a shame and an outrage for believers to go back into sin. It's like a dog who knew to his vomit. A pig goes back to the mire. But we, we that know, we understand that we're no better than them. 
We've just been cleansed and put on the robes of righteousness of Jesus. I don't want to get those robes dirty, do you? Book of Revelation says those are ones who kept the robes clean. How do you keep your robe clean? As soon as you get any impurity on it, you wash it. Only the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. You wash by coming back to him. How am I going to do the work? The Spirit. Trust in him. He'll do it. What about the effort? Oh, you got to be called on to put the effort on, to be there and to strive in the Lord. But you're trusting in him to complete it. That's the difference. Father, we thank you that tonight, Lord, we learn a great and valuable lesson. It is not by might, it is not by power, but by your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for your kindness today, allowing us, Lord, to be with you and allowing us, Lord, to fellowship with you and with one another. Lord, I pray tonight, please, by your mercies, empower us with your spirit, Lord. We cry out to you for your spirit, Lord, and we ask you for help. Oh, this great mountain that we have in front of us, how are we ever going to get through it? Not by might, not by power, by my spirit. And Lord, if we have fallen, if we are dirty tonight, we come to you as a faithful God who would cleanse us. Despite the accusations of Satan, we stand as a branch plucked out of the fire with the robes of righteousness. Lord, help us to keep them clean and undo us with power. Lord, anoint us with power. Help us to stand waiting and near the Lord of all the earth. Lord, we ask in faith that you would demonstrate your mercies and power in our lives this week. Help us to draw near to you, Lord. You made a great promise. You will draw near to us. In Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week in the Lord.